Casey Gray here, and you are watching another episode of The Conscious Builder Show. And on today's episode, I have an amazing conversation with somebody I highly respect, and that his name is Ross Elliott. He is formerly the owner of HomeSol Building Solutions, who we would use for all of our energy advising, but who, who we still use, actually. But he sold that in 2018, so he's now retired. And why I, one of the reasons I think this conversation is so great is because He's not here selling anything. He's sharing his thoughts, his experience, his opinions. And the greatest thing about this is that he walks his talk too. He doesn't just say what we have to do. He actually does what we have to do as well. He has been involved with green building for over 40 years. So longer than I've been alive, he's been doing this, but he's licensed carpenter builder and an energy advisor. He was one of the first in Canada to be certified as a consultant for both the German and North American passive house standards among a lot of other qualifications. And he's built his own carbon neutral net zero energy lead gold slash R2000 home. Uh, he has a straw bale office and a unique greenhouse, which is the first in the world to use soap bubbles for insulation and shading. Essentially, it's like a cloud that comes over the, the greenhouse. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Uh, but these days, uh, Ross and his wife, Catherine, can be found gathering sap from 240 buckets. He doesn't use lines, I just found out, uh, but he's got 240 maple buckets uh, maple tree buckets around his property, which he gathers and boils and he produces maple syrup from. So this conversation, uh, based on his background, you can see we're going to have, get into a lot of different things. Ross and I always have fantastic conversations. A uh, few things that he touches on is passive house. We get a lot of comments on passive house versus passive solar, right? There's very different things. And Ross explains that. And you can hear not just from me, you can hear from somebody who's been in the business longer than I've been alive on what the difference is and why it's important and why we need to make a change and why we need to make decisions and why government needs to step up and start making decisions. So like I said, Ross is opinionated, but he backs it up and it's hard to argue against some of his points, uh, but I do put some questions to him. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Ross Elliott. All right, Ross, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a while since we've uh, spoken last. Yeah, good morning, Casey. Good to see you again. Um, I'm excited to catch up and hear. I know a little bit about what you've been doing. Uh, particularly, though, I'm interested in, in how you disappeared <laughs> for, <laughs> for a little while. Uh, but we have uh, obviously a whole lot of things that we can get into. And I have a feeling that we might need more than one episode to, yeah, to yeah. kind of get into all this. But... Um, People have heard your bio now. Uh, it's obviously interesting, uh, a lot of experience in building sustainable homes. And I, I like to start on like where this interest initially came from before we get into all the other exciting things. Cause you've been doing this a long time, uh, longer than I've been alive, so. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Um, yeah, it was, uh, I actually got really interested in when I took a three week uh, build your own home, like a home uh, owner builder course at Shelter Institute in Bath, Maine. Um, so that covered everything. I was uh, 22, 23 years old, something like that. Um, and uh, so at the end of three weeks, I knew everything. <laughs> I was an engineer, I, I could engineer, you know, the, the breaking uh, point of beams and the bending moments of floor joists. And I could, I knew all about plumbing and electrical and roofing and foundations. And, uh, and of course, you know, carpentry and drywall and windows and insulation and I knew everything in three weeks <laughs> so that's an that amazing a, course I'd love to uh, know about that course. yeah it was really good you know for <laughs> typical 23 year old give you three weeks of uh, and I know everything there is to know about buildings um, but it was really interesting to back then they were talking about sustainability and energy efficiency and uh, and and at that time you know we were talking about fossil fuels actually running out even though climate change had already you know, been identified in the science community, it wasn't really into the popular culture yet. So what, what uh, year would this have been? That would be 1979. Oh, wow. Yeah, so the, the thing was we need to like prepare for a future where we don't have fossil fuels and we have to use a lot less energy. And now we have to prepare for a future of climate change. We have to use a lot less energy. It's the same, the same uh, solution to just a different problem. So that was where I got started. Then the next year, let's see, uh, Pat Henning and uh, Charlie Wing started Shelter Institute. Then they 
they went their separate ways. And Charlie Wing went down the road to Brunswick, Maine and started an energy auditor training course. So the next year I went to, to uh, Cornerstones, which was about 10 minutes down the road from Shelter Institute and uh, took a course with Charlie Wing about how to do energy auditing. Um, and they had like one of the first blower doors that was ever made it was there and uh, which was you know developed here in Canada, but the first commercially owned made blower door. Uh, so that would be 1980. And uh, I became a certified um, or a licensed energy auditor in the state of Maine uh, back then. And we used to send our, uh, our modeling stuff to a mainframe computer in Boston. There was no such thing as a laptop or a desktop computer then. We do it all on punch cards, send it off to uh, by courier to a mainframe computer in Boston, and then he would send us back the report all on, uh, you know, the the dot matrix printers with the you tear the sides off the paper and it comes yeah. in a hole, <laughs> take it, <laughs> punch it all, and put it in, give it to the client. So I was doing energy auditing back in 1980, so that was where I got started. But um, then I I went to work for a company somewhat like yours uh, called um, uh, Calendar and Associates in Perth that did very high end, uh, very custom and extremely energy efficient, like one of the first R2000 builders in Canada. And that was all we did was, was you know, five piece colonial trims and crazy things like that. Just beautiful work. And I was completely unqualified to be, uh, <laughs> to be doing that kind of carpentry work in my, you know, just as I first started out. And I got my carpentry license in 1983. So I started at kind of at the top <laughs> and worked my way down to being, to working on commercial jobs in the, in the union after, but I guess I spent five years in residential, then another five years in commercial. And then we hit a recession in, uh, was it 93 or something like that? And uh, there was no jobs to be had anywhere in construction because everything was shut down. And, and the only construction companies that could survive were the ones with deep pockets. So they would, you know, could afford to keep their best guys working for a while till the recession was over. And, and I thought that'd be a great time to start my own business, which I, since I obviously knew nothing about business. So I spent seven years as a, as a contractor trying to survive and starting out in the middle of a recession and so the only way you can really do that is to charge less than the established guys and yeah it was it was a you know you know you know how it works yeah <laughs> you know? yeah the business of construction is a, is a real learning experience so that's uh yeah, and they after don't, that, they don't teach you business in carpentry school or or that that's three right week, that three-week program you took it's, it's one of the <laughs> toughest businesses for sure to be in um, I got married to Catherine in 99 and, uh, and she said, well, you know, you got to start making money in this business. And so I went for another year and I didn't even mention it to her. I just looked at the books and I said, it's another bad year. We're just going to have to go and uh, do something else. At that time, I was doing blower door tests and energy audits uh, on the side. And, you know, I'd go out on the weekend with a blower door. I'd make $200 and it was $200 and other than, you know, a small amount of expenses. And, you know, in the construction business, you could get $2 million and you might only have 200 left by the time you pay all your bills. Right. So it was, um, so that's when I got fully into the, uh, into the energy auditing and, and consulting business was, uh, was after the, I shut down the construction business and started constru uh, home solve building solutions. So that's a brief history. Yeah. So I'm curious. So when you started doing those initial tests, like what has changed, obviously the, the computers have changed, but are, are you still looking for the same things? Like, what is what you learned then still applicable now or has there been a lot of changes in the building science as throughout the years since you've started i'm sure you've seen quite mm -hmm. a bit and and what works and what doesn't work yeah well one of the things that's really gotten a lot better is the modeling as you know in passive house we can use we can go to rate and get some really good details on the, on the modeling but at the same time we kind of need to use different software to get different results. The passive house software is sometimes underestimates overheating, for example. Um, so you have to use your intuition along with maybe a couple of different modeling programs to come up with what's really going to happen in a house before you build it. But we do have some excellent modeling uh, software that can uh, predict well in advance how much energy the house will use, um, where the best places are to put your, you know, additional insulation, when to stop putting more insulation in and work on the mechanicals, um, you know, what air tightness will do, the, particularly the effect of windows. Windows are really important because they become, you know, the, one of the biggest holes in the wall if, after you've 
dealt with other things. So the, the energy modeling has vastly improved. And uh, of course, now we're working with laptops instead of mainframe computers. Right. Mm -hmm. So that that's, since you already brought up, I, I have a list of questions here in no particular order, like I mentioned before, but uh, let's go right into Passive House actually, and then come back to some of the mm. stuff. And I, I, I want to talk about your house, your 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 greenhouse, which is really interesting with the with bubbles. Uh, mm. So there, there's a lot of different things I want to talk about. But since you mentioned Passive House, let's go there first. Uh, we get comments from people, like obviously we're putting a lot of videos out there. And there seems to be confusion between like what a certified passive house is and, and there's diff different certifications versus mm -hmm. a passive solar house. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain that in, I don't know, I guess as simply as possible and what oh, yeah. opinions are on that? <laughs> yeah, this as simply as possible. Well, I had somebody I have having a conversation with on social media where these things kind of happen and somebody said they were building a passive house in, in New York state. And I said, oh, who's your certifier? Because they were right nearby and I kind of wondered, you know, who was, who was doing the work for them. But all my contractors at all uh, are using like the North American or the, or the German standard. They said, no, it's just, it's just passive. Uh, you know, we have big windows in the South and uh, you know, my contractor has, uh, has assured us it's a, it's a passive house. It's like, well, that was the mistakes we were making in the 1970s. You know, people would use, big walls of south facing glass and say it's a passive solar house and uh, it would turn into an oven and during the day and it would freeze at night and uh, that's so that mistake is still being made the, thinking that a passive house is something that has lots of windows on the south and it's really not that at all it's it's more to do with a house that can passively you know sit there using the least amount of inputs to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer um, the windows are important, but it doesn't have to be like oversized on the south and nothing on the north. It, there's there's so many considerations that come into play and the windows are just one part of it. So that's one mi mistake people tend to suddenly equate a passive house with passive solar and that you're going to heat the house with the with the, the heat that comes through your windows from the sun. Uh, it'll gather heat during the day and then they get into thermal mass. It's magical thermal mass. Well, we'll just put like gigantic rock fireplaces in the middle of the house and then it'll never get cold at night. And this magical thinking doesn't work for buildings. And the, the strange thing that I find is that who would like use magical thinking for a car, you know, at a 10th of the cost and, and a more, you know, a 20th of the lifespan of a house. And uh, you just, somebody could like tell you that this car would, you know, do something, but it's not, not been properly engineered or anything. You say, Oh yeah, I'll buy that at 10 times the price. Um, understanding what a house will do before you build it is really important and I don't know why everybody doesn't do it. So the difference between certified versus seat of the pants engineering is kind of like doing seat of the pants engineering for a car except it's 10 times the cost and, and the 20 times the lifespan. Um, so as I was saying about proper modeling, we really do have the tools to be able to figure out if something's going to overheat. Uh, we can tell you exactly what the temperature swings will be even if we don't even put a mechanical system and just turn off the furnace and watch what happens and, and then see what happens if you do turn on the furnace or the heating, heating supply, which hopefully is non-fossil fueled, and, um, and see how much energy that added heat will actually use. So th we really know how to do this stuff now. So why wouldn't you get it certified? And certified doesn't mean, mean that you got a piece of paper. What, what certified means is that somebody who's trained sat down and modeled the house to the absolute nth degree and came up with where is the most cost effective way to make this home perform the way that the owner wants it to. And it doesn't always have to meet say the passive house standard. You could be aiming for the passive house standard and then you'll see that to get the last 10% of energy savings, you might have to spend another $10,000 for example. And then the homeowner can say, well, to save, you know, X number of dollars when I'm already 90% of the way to passive house, which is about three times better than building code as it is, they might decide to stop there. But how do they know where they want to stop? How do they know where they don't want to spend extra money? For example, windows, you can get, you can import your windows from Austria. Where did you get your windows from? You, you had, uh, oh, no, where you got them from. Yeah. Company yeah, that was no longer in existence. But you got, them, <laughs> you got them from a Canadian supplier and you could have, you could have spent, you know, double, Triple? Oh yeah, uh, no, we had we had quotes yeah. that ranged from 
uh, I think 65,000 to 130,000. Yeah. So there you go. So for an extra $65,000, you could have squeezed another 2% out of your, uh, or yeah. whatever, maybe 5%, you know, because you're already way down there. And the way, the way that you can make that decision is to be able to actually see that in modeling, not it, not in, uh, not just the contractor's opinion or the heating, con heating contractor's opinion or the window guy's opinion, but actually modeling it is, is what, to me, what certification is all about. And in order to be a passive house certifier, uh, you have to really know your staff. You have to pass an exam. Like that, the exam that I wrote for a, be a passive house consultant was harder than anything I ever wrote in university. It was a three-hour exam. It took me the full three hours, and there were some questions I didn't have time to answer. It was oh, wow. that hard, <laughs> and it was brutal. I mean, it was really you know engineering level calculations in there. I think it's no joke getting you certified. So when you get somebody to do passive house certification, they're just not you know. Joe's energy auditing business. There's somebody who took some serious training and uses some some real hardcore software to get to not only energy efficiency as well, because it also has to do with uh, air quality, durability, preventing mold. You know, I work in First Nations housing and I see mold all the time and mold is completely It's a science uh, question and, and it's not hard to build homes that don't have mold. And yeah. yet they continue to build houses that they call energy efficient. You know, the ones that they are now building in First Nations communities. I'm sure that everybody says, oh, these are very energy efficient. Well, then why do they grow mold? Oh, well, you know, they got some thermal bridging over here, but we didn't model for that. So we didn't know it was going to get cold. We don't think about the, we don't think about the, the moisture in the air and, and where it's good, you know, all of these things, or they put crappy windows in and then the windows have water running down, you know, the, these sorts of things, I think bringing a consultant in is is uh, cheap insurance to make sure that the house is going to perform the, the way you want it to. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, I, that's why I, I wanted to pose a question to get your thoughts. Obviously, you and I have talked a lot about this stuff in the past, not recently, yeah. um, but you always bring up great points. And one of the things like with with so like to your point, you need that sun or it's, it's helpful to have the sun, but you don't need it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's one thing that I realized too, after, you know, building and living in, in a certified passive house is that uh, this relying on the sun was actually an unreliable source, right? Mm -hmm. It was, yeah, yeah. it was out when you didn't want it sometimes and gone when you could use it or you would, mm -hmm. would appreciate it. Um, so I think uh, just, it's more than the sun. It's more, uh, it's more than uh, another thing that we get is solar panels. Like, oh, we, we had the funniest comment. I, I partly want to read it because this person was so angry for some reason, but mm -hmm. they're saying that they could build a better house and just put on, you know, spend the extra 150 grand on solar panels and have rock concerts and stuff, right? Instead, but I, I you know, the, it's not the point it's about the energy. It's about what you're getting into. It's the health too, right? It's the comfort mm -hmm. of the home, not just the energy uses. How does it feel in that home. You don't want to live in a home that has temperature swings of 10 degrees. That's not going to be comfortable. Right. Right. So, and, and that's, that's what we try to promote. You want to live in a home that's healthy when you leave for an extended period of time and you come back and it still smells fresh inside, you've done yeah. something right. Absolutely. Right. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's talk. And actually I want to talk you, one more thing you mentioned while you're going there is thermal masses. That's not something I talk a lot about. Mm -hmm. What are, what are your opinions on thermal masses and, and are they useful or not? Well, the thing about thermal mass is it doesn't do anything if it stays at the same temperature. And heat moves in, in, uh, in direct proportion to temperature difference. So if you have warm thermal mass in a very cold room, it, the thermal mass will contribute a lot of BTUs to that room until the thermal mass reaches equilibrium with the temperature of the room, which would be like, you know, Ideally, it would be halfway between what the temperature was and what, you know, so that you know, till till it loses it all, then it be, reaches equilibrium. But what happens when you're at, you know, you want to keep something at room temperature, at a comfortable room temperature, somewhere between say, 20 and 22 degrees, and uh, what's your thermal mass going to do if it's, if it gets up to 23 degrees and you want it at 20 degrees, then the thermal mass will absorb some of that and keep it from you know rising higher. Um, and let's say you want to gather some heat from the sun during the day. So you've got this, you know, thermal oven effect, you've got way too much glazing on the south side. You try to get that overheating to absorb into a giant stone fireplace. It's only going to, going to absorb really into like the first inch of the stone. 
it's going to have some effect, but it's not a magical, you know, solution to overheating. And it's not a way to heat your house either. Um, here's an interesting idea. I, I've, I'm sitting in a, in a room right now that has a lot of thermal mass in it. It's a, an ICF wall. So you've got six inches of concrete in the core, but it's also got four inches of stone on the outside. Now, people don't think of thermal mass as being something that's on the outside of the house. But the temperature during the day gets quite warm or whatever temp it gets warmer during the day, no matter what day we are, middle of winter, it might get up to, you know, zero and then it might go down to minus 20 at night. But, you know, at middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning or whatever, or three o'clock in the morning when it's at its coldest outside, the thermal mass, the stone on the outside of my house is still thinking it's midnight. And then by the time it starts to warm up again, it never really hit that coldest point. It's very strange, but it's true. The stone on the outside of my house is doing more good than the concrete core in the ICF. But, and then again, the effect of that is so minuscule that we don't even want to, you know, count on thermal mass to do anything. If we, if we need to use thermal mass, then maybe what we need to do is think about why is there, why, why are there temperature swings in our building? We don't want to overglaze on the south side so the building will overheat and then try to suck that extra heat out of out of the out of the house and store it in thermal mass. That's not a really good way to approach it. And back to what you were saying before about you know facing south and all of this. The first thing you want to do, particularly with a custom home, is is live with the site for a bit and see where do you like to look out your windows. It, the north side might be where all the beautiful views are. In fact, I've, I've made fun of a building who, by an architect who I won't name, who's very famous in, in Ottawa. Well, when you're on the Ottawa side of the Ottawa River and your view is the Ottawa River and you make the entire north side glass, it makes for a really stunning um, you know, cover of a magazine or an architectural digest or something. But you wouldn't want to live in that house with so much glass facing, facing north. You have to have a huge heating system. Uh, same thing, if you turn that house around, the views are to the south, you're going to have a huge air conditioning system. Yeah. Um, so you'd have to do a lot of work on making sure that if you want to have an all, all north facing or all south facing glass, because that's just what you want, you've got to do a lot of work on figuring out what glazing to use. So I'm getting a little sidetracked on that, but it's important to know your site first. What do you want to see out the windows? Then figure out, well, if I want to face north, face most of my glass north, or I want to face most of my glass south, or even worse, you know, do west and watch the setting sun. Um, you can do that. That's not what passive building is all about. Passive building is saying, okay, here's my parameters I have to work with. Now I've got to fight against this afternoon overheating. How am I going to do that? What's, what's going to be the shading coefficient of my glass? And what effect will that have now? And all of these other things. But don't try to rely on thermal mass to solve the problem. <laughs> it's got to be yeah. something much more, much more scientific than that. Yeah, and and that's what I tell people too is like you don't need the perfect lot for a passive house if that's what you're planning to build, mm -hmm. right? You you work with the lot uh, mm -hmm. for sure. And actually, because we're not in our passive house now, and, and what we've come to appreciate is being in this house. It's actually nice having uh, east that east sun in the morning and west yeah. in the afternoon and, and making use of that and working that into a design as well instead of like our last house we did have a lot of set we had overhangs to block the sun mm -hmm. at certain times of days but most of our views were to the to the south but i'm not as concerned about that anymore knowing what i know today versus mm -hmm. you know, seven years ago uh so anyways thanks for all that uh let's talk a little bit about your house you've kind of been doing experiments with it for quite a, quite yeah. some time now. So uh, let's give the listeners of yours a, a little bit of a okay, rundown well, of what your house is. Well, it's a 1930 farmhouse. It was uh, 600 square feet, uh, rough rough stud two by four framing with a <clears throat> one inch of she wood sheathing on the inside and the outside of that, and then one inch wood siding. And then back in the chip grant days, somebody had a, had cellulose blown in the walls really badly. So we did a, a infrared picture of the outside of the house and was voids more way more voids than there were insulation. Then we drilled we drilled holes where all the insulation wasn't, which was just about everywhere. The house looked like like Swiss cheese. <laughs> Dense packed all of that with cellulose. Added four inches of extruded polystyrene. Now I've got some issues with you know I'm. I'm much more a fan of natural building materials than using plastics and, and high carbon stuff. But we know a lot more about those things. We could talk about that, um, you know, using low carbon materials. But 
I was actually given uh, a tractor trailer load of extruded polystyrene as a sponsorship from Owens Corning. So we used a lot of polystyrene. So four inches of extruded polystyrene on the outside of that wall, then an inch and a half of polyiso cyanuride foil faced foam board on the inside, quarter inch airspace for the foil would do something, which gives us an extra R1 and a bit more insulation. And then everywhere we used 5 8 fire code drywall, talking about thermal mass, there's a good way to get to get some mass in the house and also some fire safety. So that's the 600 square feet, but then we added, we got a total of 2,000 square feet. So we added another 1,400 square feet. So that the, the wood frame addition is um, two by six with uh, uh, medium density polyurethane spray foam and uh, four inches of extruded polystyrene to the outside. We've got an R70 roof and the, the ICF in this part of the house was billed as an R40, which it wasn't. I mean, you know, you actually do the, the numbers on it. It was, it was more like an R, it was an R34. So I added another inch of, uh, cause I had to get to that R40. It is, they sold it as <laughs> R40, I want R40. So, but it also gave us a good base for the clay finish on the inside. So you have another inch of, of expanded polystyrene foam board on the inside of that. And then the four inches of stone on, on the outside. So the, there was, there's probably, I think there's four different wall sections, two or three different, yeah, three different roof sections. Uh, a couple of different foundations. We have a, a, you know, a slab here with a six inches of extruded polystyrene under it. And then we've got a, a small basement, old stone basement. And uh, we got this house down to net zero. In fact, my hydro, I haven't had a hydro bill for about four months, all through the entire winter. And usually my hydro bill ranges somewhere between minus 80 and minus $60 a month. And uh, we're running on a uh, air source heat pump here. We have a wood boiler. We've also got geothermal, which sucks a lot of power, so we don't use it very often. There's another another topic for another day. Um, <laughs> but the air source heat pumps are much better than geothermal are right now. And uh, so we've got a 10 kilowatt photovoltaic system that's um, grid tied. So we're, we're feeding it into, into the grid and uh, making are money you, off of it. Are you net metering or, or did you get on the microfit? No, we got net metered. Okay. Yeah, so we get uh, they 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 give us like the low rate and then they charge us the, the higher rate and the, yeah. <laughs> the, they, they actually I guess we're paying about the same what we sell and what we get it for. Um, so that's got us. We have a an Energuide rating of zero with a star beside it, which means that we have uh, we generate more power than we use according to the the Enercan uh, modeling software. Um, and we're so we're generating all the power we need here for our, our electric car. We have a 700 square foot straw bale building that's uh, just I'm just looking out at right now, which is where we lived while we built this house. And we've got a 2,000 square foot greenhouse. So all of those all of those buildings together are are uh, not using as much energy as, as in terms of electricity at least than uh, than we send to Ontario Hydro. Now, if we actually looked at it in terms of all energy that's used, including the wood heat, we're probably uh, you know, not really net zero energy. We're probably using a little more energy than we're producing. According to the modeling software, which is only based on this house, then we're, we're even including the wood uh, because it takes all of that into, into account, which you know, some of you viewers might not realize. We could talk about net zero if we have time. Yeah, uh, well, it's a, what's, what I'm picking up is, Yes, you're saving because you have the wood burning aspect, but you also have an electric car that you're plugging into it as right. well, right? Which is mm -hmm. using quite a bit of electricity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it powers our car, powers our house. It also, you know, offsets uh, a lot of the energy that we're getting from other sources. The wood that we burn comes from our five acres. We have a sugar bush that's, you know, infested with cedar and stuff, and we have, you know, trees that die off and. Uh, we can like we would burn like one large maple tree say in, in in a whole year in terms of heating and that's carbon that's a carbon neutral uh, heating source even though it produces carbon dioxide when you burn it if that tree falls down in the forest and, and rots away it gives off exactly the same amount of carbon dioxide which it has absorbed from the atmosphere in its lifetime which you know the last 40 to 100 years let's say um, unlike fossil fuels, which are take, burning, you know, releasing carbon dioxide that was, was absorbed from the atmosphere 2 million years ago. So it's a carbon neutral heat source. 
And uh, what else? Um, well, we've got a whole lot of other features we could talk about. But, <laughs> well, that, uh, that's one thing but, I didn't realize. I, that's a new that's a new fact that I that I just learned is the fact that what it gives off when a tree dies versus when burning it. Um, that's one thing I wasn't aware. I was aware that it was releasing that, but then it could be mm -hmm. reabsorbed. But uh, that's really interesting to know. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your greenhouse and how you. <laughs> uh, so the greenhouse, um, we always like to mention that that the day we were pouring the concrete for that, we had CBC on the radio and. And we were, you know, we, you know how it is with pouring concrete. You, you can't, uh, you just got to keep your eye, your eye on the concrete. We were out there all day long, uh, listening to about planes flying into the World Trade Center. It was that day. So CBC. Oh wow. Yeah, the for our first anniversary, and we were building this greenhouse that was, uh, it's insulated and shaded with soap bubbles. And we ran that for about five years with the soap bubbles in in place. And the way that works is there's a. a space between the inside and outside glazing layer of between two and three feet and we'd fill that with soap bubbles just like dish soap that would be generated from a, a foam generator up in the ridge and it would fill that entire space for the whole greenhouse which 50 feet long 30 feet wide fill the whole space between the two layers of glazing with soap bubbles in about three minutes then it would just stop right and it would just sit there with bubbles and it would hold in the heat or keep out the this it'd be like pulling a cloud over there a cloud over it during a sunny day it would drop five degrees right away as soon as i came over top of it because the bubbles are stored underground so they would come up out of the ground and actually cool the building in the summertime cool it right down and then keep it cool because it would be like bringing a cloud over it when it got too hot in the winter time same thing at the end of the day or the you know the sun's been coming in the building all day warms up the soil and then as it starts to cool down you bring the bubbles in again and it creates an insulation layer. So the bubbles are R1 per inch. So 30 inches gives you an R30. It's like pulling a like 10 inch blanket of fiberglass bats over your building at, at will and locking in the heat all night. And it it would stay beautifully warm all night long and it would never freeze. We had all kinds of plants growing in there straight through the winter. The uh, the limiting factor in the middle of the winter is, is a lack of, uh, of enough sunlight. So you could grow tomatoes, but they didn't like the, the lack of sunlight and things like that. After five years, we put on a triple polycarbonate layer that was, um, you know, gives us like an R3. It's not the same by any means, but we decided we didn't want to grow in, uh, in January and February anyways. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, that's the story of the, of the bubble greenhouse. Now it was the first one in the world. And then since then we've got gigantic cannabis greenhouses, one in Las Vegas and, and one in BC, they're using the same technology. I was involved with them as a consultant up until, uh, up until the time I you know, gave up all my liability insurance and everything, because we you know, had professional liability insurance when we're dealing with you know, a project in a you know, $100 million range, um, I'd rather not you know, just be giving them my, my uh, expertise with no uh, liability insurance. Not that I thought there would be, ever be anything go wrong, but you just don't, you know, be like you running a construction business with no liability insurance. It wasn't yeah. a good idea. So I bowed out of it at that point, and uh, I hope that they're uh, they're finishing up their projects now. So that <laughs> I got a background uh, background <laughs> words over here. Do we still sell soap soap solution? We developed the the solution that we use for that, uh, so it doesn't leave any residue between the glazing. It doesn't break down, and it's endlessly recyclable. What happens is the bubbles are made from a, a soapy's water solution. It's about 0.6 percent soap concentrate 99.4 percent water that's what blows the bubbles and uh then they break down and they go back to liquid and head back to the tank and then keep they're endlessly you know can be endlessly be regenerated in fact oh, i still wow. have it i still have a tank of soap solution it's buried underground in the in the uh <laughs> in the greenhouse i could hook that up to a foam generator today and generate bubbles from it and it never breaks down. It doesn't grow mold or, or you know, kind of algae or anything like that. And it doesn't leave any residue. So other people that have tried this technology have had problems like leaving glop in between your glazing and algae growing in it and everything. So we, we as Catherine mentioned, like we did develop a soap solution that, that works for that. That's, yeah, that was actually going to be one of my next questions. So, um, okay, so... Uh, Let's talk a little bit about what you think we need to do as, like as a whole, like as a race, we're, what do you feel we need to do now to 
save the planet essentially, right? Like where I feel a lot of people I've been talking to, it's, it's no longer climate change. It's a climate crisis, right? And mm-hmm. you even brought this up at the beginning. You've been, people have been talking about this since 70s and 80s. And mm-hmm what has really been done, right? If we look at everything, have we actually done as much as we should have or could have? Uh, I would say no, no. Uh, but what what do you think we need to do as as maybe individuals and then as well as maybe construction companies? You know, what can we do to push this forward? Well, you know, like look at it this way. When I was, when I graduated from high school in 1975, there were half as many people on the earth as there are now. And in 1975, we were already talking about population bomb there's a book by paul ehrlich i think it was or um but they, we were already talking about uh population now there's a lot of people that get upset about that and say well if we all lived like um you know people in bhutan we could have three times as many people on the earth but the fact is we don't the fact is the more people that we have the more deforestation is which also drives climate change the more meat eating there is which also drives climate change the more you know the more vehicles we drive around the more manufactured goods we get so so that you know population has doubled at the same time the number of people who live in our houses is about half of what it was in 1975 but how what size of our house are our houses now they're double so we have houses that are twice the size of half as many people on a planet that has double the number of people on it than there was when i when i was in high school that's just one issue and so it's not just a case of um you know, let's put a, a heat pump in our houses instead of an, a gas furnace, which I have very strong opinions about what's going on with Enbridge and, um, and the Canadian government and the way the gas lines are put into every, every, uh, every development, just without even question, as if, um, you know, fossil fuels are the only way to heat, uh, heat houses and to, to do hot water. And that kind of thinking has, has got to stop. We actually have to start thinking about using, you know, carbon neutral heating sources but it's not just the not just the uh the the heating sources not just mechanical systems it's not just the insulation um chris magwood has done some really good work and and uh, bruce um i forget his name he wrote written, written a really good book which i'll share with you later on the carbon content of building materials so as we get really good at insulating and air sealing and putting proper triple glazed you know uh, highly efficient windows in, uh, and good mechanical systems, all of a sudden where we didn't used to care about the embodied energy in the buildings because it's only 5% of the total energy use over the lifespan of the building, all of a sudden now the carbon content of the building materials that we're using is like 20% or 25% of the lifetime of, the, you know, of a passive house there, even more. So we have to consider what our building materials are. So that's just one thing of many uh, vehicles. Uh, are you driving an electric vehicle or? No, not I know truck, trucks are not so yeah. uh, they're not. I have they're not as many choices for trucks, and you have to get. I've, um, I've I've actually started doing something that we're doing weekly now, like a weekly uh, tech video and all the mm-hmm. technology that's coming out in construction. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I've been watching for quite some time now is the trucks. Uh, I'm not a fan mm-hmm. of the look of the Tesla truck, but no. there's a lot of really cool uh, and. Uh, electric trucks coming out in the in the next few years i think so yeah I'm, that's, that's I'm watching that very closely things are going to change quickly i hear volkswagen is going to be 100 percent electric by 2030 yeah they're, they're yeah. trying to knock out tesla so um yeah the, so this is the you know the future will be electric vehicles but if we all go out and buy two or three of them you know the, the average home you know when i was growing up would have one vehicle now most houses that every adult in the house has got their own vehicle parked in the yard uh so we, as we consume more and more, we have to think about, you know, the carbon content of what we're consuming. Well, then we get into carbon tax. We shouldn't even say the word tax because that riles up some people. Uh, carbon fee and dividend, where you pay uh, a little, a little bit towards the the cost of the carbon being emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, so the carbon content or the the, the emissions pro- profile of the materials that you're using will have a fee added on you know, commensurate with how much effect it's got on the atmosphere. And then you get all of that money back, but distributed equally to everyone. So those who are using low carbon materials and low carbon ways of living, driving electric cars, living in a passive house, will get back a whole lot more than people who are, you know, living a much higher carbon lifestyle. So you get the choice. If you if you want to spend more money than your neighbor by, you know, 
living in a crappy house, which I don't know why you would. Let's have, I, there's a whole thing. Like people actually balk at putting more insulation in sometimes. You know, I had yeah. a guy putting, he was putting $60,000 worth of stone on the outside of his house. And he was just using standard building code, two by six walls. And at that time it was an R20 bat and nothing else. And I said, you know, you could save a lot of energy if you, you know, before you put that stone on there, put a layer of foam board on the outside of the house. And he said, well, you know, how much would that save me? And it was like, worked out to something like $1,200 a year. And he's like, I can, I can afford that. And obviously it was $60,000 worth of stone, 1200 bucks is nothing, it's pocket change. You know, he's a rich guy. He didn't care. He, I couldn't convince him to add, add like a, an inch or inch and a half of foam board to the outside of the house because the money wasn't, wasn't important. But now we're not talking about building houses that save money. Now we're talking about houses that save the planet. Right. So what do we do as a race? That's a big pro, a big question. So, you know, we can bring it down to buildings, which they say that um, in Canada, residential buildings are responsible for 14% of uh, carbon emissions, according to Anarchan. They're not taking into account a lot of different things. They're not taking into account to the, uh, the electricity used because the electricity is a separate, um, a separate category, the duration of electricity. So they don't count that in the 14%. They don't count the building materials that are used in the construction of the, of the building. They don't count, you know, how many times the contractors' trucks have to drive back and forth to the job site all through, through construction. So, you know, residential houses right there are probably well over 20%. Um, Ed Masria, the um, architecture, third, architecture 2030, um, if you look up that website, he says that buildings in general globally are 46% of carbon emissions. So we're somewhere between, you know, 15 to 50 percent of buildings are they are one of the biggest things we can do something about, and they're the easiest thing to do something about. What do you end up with when you have a a, a building that uses less energy? Something that's a lot more comfortable, something that hopefully is a lot healthier because we're going to also take care of the air quality and the ventilation systems. So there's no downside to to having a more energy efficient homes. Um, it seems like we're always, you know, fighting with the, 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 the large developers to try and step the building codes up a little bit. They say they're going to be net zero ready by 2030. And yet we're only halfway there now. It's, it's 2021. Like in nine years, they're going to make their, their houses twice as energy efficient as they are now, which means everybody who buys a building code house now, when they go to sell it, they're going to say, wow, this is really a terrible uh, energy efficiency compared to what I could buy new. Why wouldn't I just go buy a new one? So people are going to lose money building houses today that are built to such low levels of energy efficiency. And there's a whole other topic. Uh, CHBA would have my head if they heard me tell, telling you that reality is they talk about buildings getting more and more energy efficient. They pat themselves on the back and say, you know, they're way better than they used to be. But they're really not, not, by, not in terms of the building envelope. We have higher efficiency uh, heating systems. We used to use mid-efficiency furnaces. Now we use high efficiency furnaces. That gives you 15% right off the top. And that wasn't done by building code. That was done because industry just moved from non-condensing to condensing furnaces. We, low E windows made a big jump because before with, without low E and without argon uh, fill, um, we, we were losing a lot of heat through the windows. We cut that heat loss <clears throat> in a, you know, by about 50%. Uh, or more actually, by putting in better windows. But that didn't come from building codes either. Building codes followed that. Um, air tightness was taught in the R2000 program. I was at the very first R2000 builder training going back in history there, 1983. I was one of the first R2000 uh, certifiers or inspectors back then. And uh, the air tightness that we learned and we taught the contractors back in the 1980s became second nature to everybody. So we made buildings that were more airtight, not because of building code, but simply because contractors learned, oh, they're still stuck in the poly vapor barrier being the air, the air barrier, but at least they got something out of the R2000 program. There's better ways to do an air barrier, but that's another, another show. Um, so we made more airtight buildings with low E-argon windows and high efficiency furnaces in them. And then we went to like an R22 bat instead of an R20 bat. Oh, oh the big jump came from two by fours to two by sixes, and they take claim for that. You'll see if they, when CHBA talks about you know, how much better the buildings are, they, they take that 
date, they go back to the date when two by four walls were changed to two by six, so they could take credit for that one too. And, uh, and that was a result of the R2000 program because we, we piloted the two by six wall instead of two by four walls in the 1980s. So all of these changes that happened weren't because builders wanted more energy efficient buildings. Now, I love builders. I mean, I can't, I'm not bad mouthing any of those developers out there that we used to work with that were wonderful people that really wanted to build a great product. But as one of them told me, and a really nice guy, a third generation builder, he said, I want to build the very best building I can, but my buyers don't care. Why would I put $5,000 out of my own pocket into every house I build, and they build like three or 400 a year, put another $5,000 into every house when if I add $5,000 to the cost of a $450,000 pro, uh, pro, uh, product, they're going to go to my competitor who's building in the same development. So, you know, the same neighborhood, same schools, you know, everything except this house is $5,000 cheaper. People, the buyers didn't care. They probably still don't care by the, you know, the majority of them how energy efficient the house is. It's mm -hmm. way down their list. Uh, they say they care, but they won't pay an extra $5,000 on a $450,000 house, which is the average cost of a house. Uh, and that's just a track built house. We're not even talking custom homes. Um, so it's not being driven by the buyers. It's not being driven by the builders. And the government is taking their cue from the buyers and, and the builders. But if we're trying to save the planet, then what we need to do is, is is stop taking baby steps in energy efficiency. We know what to do. It's not a case of, of uh, well, yeah, but what if we go to here and then we go up to here and then we're gonna to go to there and then we're gonna to go to here and where are we gonna stop? We know exactly where to go. We know how to build a, a carbon neutral building. We know how to build a, a building that, that produces as much energy on its rooftop as it uses in the course of a year for all uses, including electricity and, and uh, natural gas, if you're gonna burn fossil fuels so that it offsets all of the energy use of the building. We know how to do that. CHBA, has, for, you know, for anything I might've said about, about them negatively, has developed the Net Zero, Net Zero Homes program, where you can build your home to be net zero ready so that if you put the solar panels on the rooftop, it would produce as much energy over the course of the year as it uses, but you don't have to put the solar panels on. You could do it net zero ready, which is around R2000, a little bit better. It's about, it's a bit better than twice as good as the current building code in terms of energy efficiency. And how much more does that cost to go to twice as good in energy efficiency than the current building code? It's about 3% about three more. So for 3% more, Another to say, say twelve thousand, fifteen thousand dollars, something like that. Um, you could have a house that uses half as much half as much energy. You could also have a house that uses carbon sequestering materials rather than you know, carbon emitting materials. Using cellulose insulation instead of blowing fiberglass in the attic. That's that should be a no brainer. Why should there even be a choice? Why should well there shouldn't. Again, we're back to the carbon fee and dividend. If you had yeah. to pay a lot more money for the blown fiberglass, which is made from melting rocks, versus using blown cellulose, which is made from chopped up newspaper, to get the same R value, the same amount of labor for the guy in the attic to blow it, but the carbon it's actually nicer intensive. to work with too. <laughs> yeah. So the carbon intensive one should cost more than the one that actually doesn't. It's not even low carbon. It's sequestering carbon. Wood yeah. sequesters carbon. Um, we have ways of being able to measure these things and say, if you build this house as much more energy efficient and has much lower impact on the environment, that it should cost you less, not more than the house that's having a big impact on the environment and costs every single year in higher, higher energy bills. When, when the price of natural gas is so criminally low as it is, you can't sell it to a homeowner that's only going to pay $800 a year to heat their house that, well, I could cut that in half for another $10,000 and say, yeah, but that's only $400 a year, right? It can't be up to the homeowner. It can't be up to the builder. It needs to be up to the government. And the government is, is, is showing complete, they're using, showing complete lack of leadership in not setting down some, some solid targets and, and, how we're going to reach them. They've talked about it. I mean, we're supposed to get to net zero by 2030. It's kind of like, 
I, I kind of feel like it's it's like the parent who knows better but isn't teaching the children how to do it better. You yeah, yeah. I mean? it's like we know we have to do this so that you're doing it. They're like, no, well, you can if you want, but you don't really yeah. have to. You know, it's your choice. And, and, and there's so much like, there's so much resistance from people who don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, this is this is the biggest problem we have in a democratic society. It seems that everybody has an equal say. Well, I think we need to have a little more respect for the experts that actually know what's going on that in terms of climate change, for example. Uh, it's climate change isn't something that people have an opinion on. If you don't know the science, then just, you know, listen to the experts. And if you don't believe in science, then, you know, we really, really should just completely ignore your, your input because it's not up to Let's let's ask every Canadian: Do they do we think we should uh, save the planet or not? And uh, the the majority say no. Then well, let's just let the planet you know, let's you know wipe out half the species on Earth, which is what we're headed for. Let's to destroy the oceans. Let, look at what we've done to the atmosphere. We're, we're at 420 parts for, parts per million and CO2 now, or 423 now. I, I I remember when we hit 400. That was a an unconceivable uh, level. Back so, when we were at you know three fifty, well, we what does that the, what does that number mean? Like it, for, it means for, that we've gone we to a, we were at two hundred eighty three parts per million CO two in the in the beginning in the industrial age. Like say back in say nineteen hundred, we were around two hundred eighty three, two hundred eighty five. We hit four hundred just a couple of years ago. We're now at four hundred twenty parts per million. We've we're heading for doubling the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere very soon from what it was back a uh, you know, hundred years ago and was at that level all through all of human civilization for the last people say well well if you go back to the dinosaurs or something but no our like agriculture is one of the things that's allowed our our population to explode for one thing agriculture only became possible because the last 16,000 years we've had such a, a stable climate if you throw the climate into chaos which is what we're doing you affect not just the you know humans food supply um, we're also, you know, changing, you know, whether these maple trees out here are going to survive, the, the kinds of, of, of pests that the trees are going to have to face that are gypsy moths, for example, are overpopulating and decimating our trees. And, and that's just one tiny part. All through the oceans, there's like all kinds of cascading effects that are happening because of acidification, because of warmer oceans. And that, that's a whole other, you know, a whole other show. But if people don't want to listen to the science they should just get out of the way the canadian government needs to lead they have to listen to the experts and they have to understand that we cannot continue to pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at the rate we're doing it and other things like methane which is coming from you know leaking gas frac fracking and things like that we need to take real leadership now it looks like the states will take real leadership until they elect another Republican president. So we go back and forth on these things and it depends on who's in power and, and who they're trying to please. We can't continue to do that in terms of saving the saving the planet. Uh, we need to take some, some real action and not just based on people's opinions or whether that's whether that's the climate alarmist or the climate deniers. It's not a case of opinion. Listen to the scientists. Carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for at least 100 years so what we're at already the warming effect of that will continue to to affect the planet now i could you know talk real quickly about how carbon dioxide acts like adding insulation to your house basically it's like an insulation layer over the over the planet so it keeps the heat in so it's just like putting more insulation on in your house but having the furnace run at exactly the same level as what it was so you take a house that you know has you know half as much insulation in it and then run the furnace at ex exactly the same output all the time, but put twice as much insulation on the house. The house is going to overheat. It's that simple. So it's like adding insulation, not turn because the furnace is the sun, and the sun's not going to. We can't dial down the sun, um, and forget about people that are going to send you bad things over the social media saying the sun's output is going up, and that's why we have climate change. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> it's actually it's actually gone down a little bit lately. So, but that's certainly the variations in the sun's output are not what drives driving climate change right now. It's the it's what we're doing to the atmosphere. So the bottom line is building is one of the number one solutions. The three biggest biggest uh, things we can do about climate change buildings. Uh, agriculture and transportation.
if we change, so those three things, if we can deal with those three things, we solve the problem. I heard Catherine in the background saying diet. Diet, yeah. <laughs> Got her so opinions too. <laughs> diet. So, well, that's that's agriculture, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which so, is true, right? And that's you know, um, for everyone listening and watching, like the little things do count, right? Like mm-hmm. your diet, like for example, like it has an effect on everything. Every little thing that you do, uh, mm-hmm. like I know you're vegetarian. You've been for I don't know how many years at this point. We we are as well. Um, but even if just cutting meat out for like a couple days a week can have mm-hmm. a huge impact, right? We're not going to get into that here. Like we focus on construction, but yeah. like the amount of energy, like this is what blows my mind is like, when you think about the food on your plate and where it came from and the amount of energy produced and you mm-hmm. put that, you're not getting that same amount of energy by putting it into your body, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, you can't right. put that back into, <laughs> into the earth, right? So it's that, that's something that I think about, uh, pretty often right and yeah uh, it guides a lot of my decisions so what are your thoughts so there's there's a lot we can do so technology i feel uh, i love technology that's just something that i'm interested in and i feel Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of people that say oh technology can obviously bring a lot about which is true but it can also do a lot of good and i feel like construction is one of those industries where it hasn't really been disrupted by technology yet at least in the Mm -hmm. residential world like there's not a whole lot like solar panels are getting better um do you see anything happening there that could, or you feel something that could really change and, and help the construction industry? Uh, one thing that comes to mind for me is 3D printing. Uh, I feel like 3D printing over the coming years is going to have a huge impact and hopefully mm-hmm. uh, have a positive impact on the, on the industry. Yeah. And the idea that we're going to take a 3D printer and try, you know, move down the, move down the street, 3D printing houses uh, is, <laughs> is not really how it's going to work, right? It'll be more like panelized construction, which is also, as you know, is uh, something that's really starting to, to come on strong in the construction industry. Um, there's no other product I can think of that we build piece by piece uh, on, on the site, you know, we, we bring all the, all the construction materials over to the building site and assemble them all by hand. Um, and but doing it in a in a factory under controlled conditions with uh, a lot more automation a lot more robotics and 3d printing we can produce a better product that can be then brought out to the site and and just put together like a, a lego set and uh, i think that's one of the big disruption disruptors we're going to see in the in the construction industry is a lot more panelized construction um a lot more automation um, as a carpenter i don't like that but <laughs> well, there's, there's renovations i, I feel like yeah, yeah. Guys can really help on the on the new construction but yeah. well like most of our most of our homes are already built yeah right? well they're well panelized panelized uh construction works for that too as a matter of fact i know stefan has been work, has been working with uh with Enercan on a, on a project that for low um, for social housing where they're adding yeah uh, panels to the exterior we were part a, of that originally. yeah right okay good yeah so that's you know that's a european idea that's being being used to uh to upgrade homes where they'll they'll add on to the outside not just insulation but the siding and the mechanical systems the ductwork will already be in they just put a, you know holes in the wall and attach it all to the outside comes with the the uh you know a modular you know heat pump uh, and and uh, ERV or you know, ventilation system, heat recovery ventilation system, and, and hot water already bolted on, so they can just tack that onto the outside of of houses. And and so we've got it. So the technology has advanced far enough that you don't end up with putting it all on and finding out that it doesn't line up and <laughs> corners don't meet or or it leaks. So that, but you're right. In the in the renovation industry, you could be like doing a new kitchen for someone. Yeah. And. And there's a there's a something that's near and dear to my heart. I I want to make it clear to your viewers, you know, that I've got I don't have anything to sell here. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not in the business anymore, so I'm not trying to flog anything. I'm not trying to make any money. I'm just you know spouting my my opinions. Uh, and uh, I I firmly believe that as soon as you start to do something to an existing home, you should have to meet the current building code, including uh, energy efficiency. So if you tear open a wall to put in some wiring, that wall's open, you should be not just putting in the insulation that'll fit, but the insulation that'll bring that section of wall up to current building code, which is already too low. But if you can't meet the current building code in a renovation, and the house flippers are really notorious for just 
putting window dressing on a place and just leaving it with you know as, as inefficient as it was but now it looks really nice now you don't want to go around drilling holes That's all over and pumping cellulose in i'm a terrible <laughs> house flipper because I, I i put too much effort and focus on, on what's what you don't see <laughs> right exactly you know if, if people buy it on appearances and, it, and uh so that's again. There's there's where government can can uh, step in and say, as soon as you as soon as you do something to a house in terms of renovations, you have to make that section of the house at least, even if it's just a piece of bathroom wall that you knocked open, put some tile on the wall, that you've got to bring that section up to current code. Because pretty soon, as we you know go through the different rooms of the house, we're not just talking about painting, but I mean, if you're getting into the walls for any reason, uh, adding additions or anything like that, that should bring everything up to at least the current building code. So that's um, that's one thing in terms of renovations. Yeah, um, we're, we're doing a, a renovating the house right now, 1860 stone house, which mm. we're bringing up the, like, because people are living in it, they it wasn't comfortable. So we're like, number one goal, we need this house to be more comfortable. So it's been fantastic uh, because they're actually willing to put the, the what well, ends up being money, right? So time and effort for us, but money money for them into making the home more comfortable. So we're gonna have a lot of really great mm -hmm. footage of that and we can share that and how well it performs by the end. So Stefan's involved with that as well from, from home That's solve. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that, that'll that'll be fun. Excellent. Um, okay, we've been chatting for a while. <laughs> yeah, I think we've gone over time a bit. Yeah, well, <laughs> I have to edit it all up. <laughs> it, it is what it is. Right? <laughs> this is why I love, I'm sure we could have another conversation and go on, but I love the fact that you said, look, I'm not selling anything. And, and that's yeah. a great point is like, you just, you're walking your talk, right? You're, mm. this is what you believe in. This is what you're doing and, and you're willing to continue putting it out. And that's one reason I have a lot of respect for you, Ross. Mm. And since Thanks. we first met eight mm. years ago, I think is when we decided to build our passive house mm -hmm. is whenever you, you speak, it just, in my mind, it just clicks. It just it makes sense to me, right? So you obviously have a lot more experience and, and that's what I'm, that's one of the reasons I have the respect, but you, you're you're out there and actually doing what you say too. And there's not a lot of people who do that. Uh, and I remember sitting around a, a table with people who were trying to make change, but none of them were actually doing what they were saying should be done at that table, mm -hmm. right? And you're one of the people who who does do that. So thank you for your leadership on, on that. Well, this, exactly all the same back to you as well. There's a, you're, you live, you're, you're, a, your talk as well the things that you tell your clients to do are things you're doing in your own place and uh you know you have the experience you're not just somebody who's uh you know who's trying to upsell you know like try here would you like the, the uh the granite countertop uh, we could also you know make it a passive house um, you know it's, <laughs> it's not it's not a it's not an upsell feature it's something you believe in and uh and and you're doing a great job for your clients to be able to teach them that uh Energy efficiency is not just something that's going to save them money and give them a more comfortable home uh, and more healthy home, but also is something that will make a difference for their grandchildren. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I respect you for that too. Well, thank you. Uh, well, let's end with what a day in the life of Ross Elliott looks like now that you're retired and probably working more than you ever did before <laughs> by the sides of it. Yeah. Well, I kind of wonder how I managed to like build this house and all the other things that we did while I was also working full time because I'm still like full time on uh, well finishing up a lot of projects. Right. Um, I'm a, you know, a bad one for getting a house 95 percent or 97 percent done in that last last three percent. I got I have curved window sills that need to be put in right here where I'm sitting right now. And, uh, you know, I can put a straight windowsill in in a couple of hours, but a curved windowsill is like a day per windowsill. And I've got several of them to do. They're still not done, but they will be done this <laughs> summer. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, right now, gathering maple syrup, we're doing it the old fashioned way. I don't like uh, the pipelines. They, you know, they, they leave them up all year long and they, I, I don't like the look of them. So I'm, I'm doing it the slow and hard way. So I've got like a really sore shoulder right now from <laughs> lifting buckets. We've got 240 buckets out there now. And uh, oh, wow. so that you go around to gather all of that. I've made about 30 gallons of maple syrup so far uh, this year. Um, and I'm doing it the old fashioned way there too. I don't have a reverse osmosis system, which everybody else uses that, that takes down the water content of your, of your syrup so you don't have to boil it so long. Um, we make really nice syrup. It's uh, it's nothing like the stuff you buy at Costco or anything, and uh, but it takes a lot longer and a lot more work. So that's that's using up a lot of my time lately. 
um, we're going to build a Celtic roundhouse. That my wife has been onto that. For quite I don't a while. even know what that is. What's a Celtic roundhouse? Well, apparently the Celts in uh, in uh, in England and and Ireland and Scotland and everything lived in these uh, roundhouses <clears throat> that are well round, and then they go to a steep peak. They would have a thatched roof then, or the a steep peak on it. And uh, she she came up with the idea that we should build one here. So uh, we have the foundation in. It's just a, a rubble stone, and we're going to build on top of that this year. She keeps wondering when the, when that'll be built. So that'll be a rammed earth base, kind of wavy. As everything everything I do has curves. As you, you know, if I don't, if you ever, you haven't been out to my house, have you? I've seen lots of pictures, but I haven't yeah. been out there now. Everything's I put curves and everything. So not only will it be a round building, but it'll have a wavy, curvy wall that'll be and then filled in with. Um, stack wall you know you just lay cordwood on its side and mortar it in with okay yeah. bo glass bottles and things for for light and then we'll have the the steep peak roof but instead of the coming to a a point it's going to be the more the navajo uh, hogan style with the open hole at the top yeah now, everything was supposed to be done completely traditionally but now we end up with now we got a hole in the top how do we deal with things we have bugs here and we have cold here and so then we have to put something in there next thing you know i'm going to start getting into triple glazing and everything. <laughs> i don't know um, i'm going to try to keep it as, as traditional celtic houses a celtic roundhouse as possible but there's going to be some variations because uh catherine's been saying well it's going to be such a wonderful place to to you know gather with friends and everything so, you know the celts used to live in these dark little smoky smoke filled kind of damp hole that houses with made of stone and thatch you know i don't i think i'm gonna have to like make some variations in the design <laughs> that's the next thing you know rammed earth and stack wall and some kind of a uh, it's going to be a cedar shake roof instead of thatch being a, a cone shape cedar shake roof means i'm after the first couple of first couple of rows, I'm going to have to start trimming the corners of every single shake all the way up. Right. So luckily, <laughs> uh, luckily, I'm luckly my labor is free. So no <laughs> shortage of things that. to do by the sounds of it. Yeah, we also have the greenhouse, a 2000 square foot greenhouse that we grew a lot of hot peppers in last year. So we're going to do uh, and start making hot sauces. Um, and everything yeah. you do is obviously organic too. And you're like, yeah. are you selling this stuff if people will come by or or yeah, well, the, the I know maples. you said you weren't selling anything. You weren't selling anything in the uh, in yeah. The, the we do have maple syrup. World, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we have maple syrup, so that's uh, that's right now. That's our and see maple syrup. When we you know we had to kind of figure out a budget once we dropped out of the the, uh, the business and uh, how we're going to survive on on uh, you know not not working or not making much money and uh, our the money that we make from maple syrup is is um, earmarked for our travel budget so okay if we can say sell enough maple syrup we might be able to go back to bhutan someday no i, I don't think we'll, be, <laughs> we'll never be able to go back to bhutan but we did we did that oh good jump right back to the the how i made that transition from working yes uh, you know 70 way. hours a week running a business not only did i run home solve since 1999 but i had the construction business for seven years before that so i had you know 20 years so more than that, 27 years of continuously running a business. And as you probably know, it's not a nine to five job. It's more like a seven day a week. As soon as you wake up, you start thinking about what you need to do and thinking it's about a, it. It's a five sleep. to nine job. <laughs> yeah. Seven <day> a week. <laughs> it's seven days a week, 365 days a year. When you're not working, you wish, you're thinking you should be working. Uh, so the first thing we did was we took off for three months to Southeast Asia and got rid of our our emails, got rid of our cell phone numbers, uh, to, just totally. And I, I also removed everything on the internet that had any, any reference to me. I took, got rid of my LinkedIn page, got rid of my Twitter account and my Facebook pages and just erased myself from the internet. So nobody even you know knows anything about me now. If you go back and try to look me up and say, was this guy some kind of expert? He doesn't seem to exist. Because <laughs> I just wanted to make that complete transition to be, uh, you know, away from what I'd been doing all my life and to do just what I'm doing now. So a uh, three month trip to Southeast Asia, to Sri Lanka and, uh, and Bhutan and to uh, Vietnam was a, was a, a good transition. Um, and uh, yeah, things, a lot of things have changed and since then, and um, it's, a, it's been a good move for us. But we hope that everything that we've 
kind of built up, Catherine and I have built up and is, is going to continue to grow. I know that HomeSol has more than 40 employees now and, and they're, they're operating in uh, five different provinces. So that's, that's great. I didn't yeah. realize that there was so many because no. obviously I just, I deal with stuff in Vaughan basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah we Vaughan. still <laughs> still have the office in, in Perth. Uh, Norma retired. You would have, you would have dealt a lot with Norma. So. Yeah. So I deal with Mark now since Norma's not there in the office. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, a good office manager is, is the most important thing you can have in any business for any of your, yep. any of your viewers that are, <laughs> any of your viewers that are thinking of going in business, get a really good office manager and, uh, <laughs> Well, so I so guess that covers us. everything. Yeah. And uh, I know you already gave lots of advice and stuff, but do you have any last parting words of advice that you want to share before we, before we end it? And I don't know if I should say, is there a way for people to get a hold of you or not since you've erased yourself? But mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, people can, can get a hold of me. Uh, we talked about, uh, we didn't talk about foresight, foresight design build, um, which I'm doing some work in first nations communities. Uh, still, that's one of my, what the one place that I'm still uh, active is is trying to do what I can with the the uh, First Nations housing crisis and uh, help make homes more more efficient and more healthy. Healthy is really important in, in remote communities. Um, so my uh, email address is ross r o s s at foresight foresight is uh, the number four s y t e dot c a so ross at foresight dot c a so that's the uh, touching base on what first night is. Um, and uh, last parting words. Well, well, let's just bring it back to buildings, that buildings are important. They do make a difference. And uh, it doesn't cost a lot to, to look at the, uh, the health and comfort and sustainability of homes. That um, I think people are afraid when they're, when they're dealing with something that costs so much money to step beyond building code. And uh, they're afraid that it's gonna cost a lot more, but it it really doesn't. If you're looking at Energy Star, for example, it's 25% or, or sorry, it's actually gone down now, it's more like 20% better than building code, costs you about one to 2% more. R2000 costs about three to 4% more. Net zero costs about 5% more. And if you're, or net zero ready, if you're going to net zero ready, with, net zero with the PV, about 6%. And if you're going with, to passive house, about 7 to 8%. If you're going to passive house with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing and you're not working with a, with a good consultant, 10%. So, <laughs> you know, so the people who talk about passive house costing 10% more, that scares away buyers. Um, and they say, oh, I just want to do building code. Working with an experienced builder who's working with a, with a good cons passive house consultant that actually knows how to crunch the numbers and find the most cost-effective approaches really only costs you five to 7% more to have the most efficient house that you'll, that it's not going to be talked about, you know, what level do we stop at? Well, passive house just overshoots it just a bit. You could even you could dial it down a bit, even from passive house and have the target house. But what we're talking, what we're doing right now, building code is, is just, it's a, it's a real travesty that we won't make that step. Just go from here, go to where we need to go done. So for any, for, yeah, so any, yeah, exactly. So, so for any of your clients that are listening to this, that are on the fence about, uh, you know, sustainability, whether, you know, adding that to their building on top of the granite countertop and hardwood floor and, and all these other expenses that are included in the house, it's, it's not expensive and it's doing something for the planet. It does make a difference. It's not, it's not just an empty gesture and uh, houses last for 200 years. People are going to move into my house long after I'm gone. There will be people that won't even remember who built this house. There'll be several generations of people that will go through this house and live here. And it'll still be warm and comfortable and sustainable. And they'll still say, hey, back in uh, 2006, when this house was designed, they really knew what they were doing. So I think it's, um, it's something that, you know, you're doing a great job. Your clients are doing great by, by making the decision to, to build more sustainable homes. And, uh, and I wish more builders were like you. Well, thank you, Ross. Uh, always a pleasure. We'll have to have you back on uh, probably sometime in the near future again, because there's, there's other things that we didn't get to, but yeah. thanks, <laughs> thanks and uh, until yeah. next time. Okay. 
thanks for watching another episode of the conscious builder show uh i I really hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I like having that conversation. I hope it got some wheels turning for you. There's a lot of things that we need to do as a whole, as a group, as a society. We need to come together and we need to work together to to save ourselves essentially uh, and to save, more importantly, to save the people who are coming, our children and their, their children after us, right? So uh, I really hope that this is sinking in for you. If it hasn't already, if you're listening to this, there's a good chance that you're already taking action. So kudos to you. We appreciate you Uh, if you like this please please share it with other people hit subscribe and we will catch you on the next episode